My friend, I'm Gloria Mitchell with good news for you. Today, I want to talk about being a Christian as opposed to just doing Christian deeds. And so our scripture today is found in the book of Luke chapter 10. We talk about this story. I know many times we talk about the Good Samaritan and, and we just say, oh yeah, well, we're tending to put the, the people down put the people down who were not the ones to give aid or to help that um, to help the victim in the story. But I just want to just be able to take a fresh look at that passage right now. And so Luke chapter 10, I want to even share the scripture from the Bible with you. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Well, that's just a question, a simple question. How do I receive eternal life? But he said, what must I do? This is an expert in the law. He's a lawyer. And so he knows exactly what the Torah says. The first five books of the Bible, I'm sure he knew everything that was there. So he was depending upon action, doing rather than being what the law requires. And so Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? Good answer for Jesus. So he answers the question with a question. The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Again, this is Jesus responding to the lawyer who knew the law, and he's saying, the law says, do this, 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 and this. That's doing. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith through that faith that we have in Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. And so this is in the New Testament we're sharing from, and yet he's a teacher of the law, following the law of the Old Testament. And under this law, he needed to do everything that the law says. Let's put this in uh, perspective. Um, let's say, oh, I have a friend who called and said, I got a ticket for talking on a cell phone. I said, well, you know, that's the law. He said, yeah. He said, but I wasn't moving. It wasn't a moving violation. I was in my car. I was seated or stopped at a red light. I was obeying the law because I stopped at the light. Yeah, but you're holding up a cell phone to your ear, talking on it, even though the car's not moving. Yes, you got the ticket because you broke the law. So to put this in perspective, once you break one part of the law, any portion of the law, you're a lawbreaker. That's simply what this amounts to. And so Jesus is saying, hey, do what the law says, do everything the law says, and then you will live. You will have eternal life. Well, this man knew that it was impossible to do everything the law says. He couldn't adhere to the entire law. So then the man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? All right, now Jesus replied to him with an illustration. 
Now, here's the illustration that we often look at the illustration, but we forget what triggered it. So that's why we talked about why Jesus is replying to him this way. So he gives this illustration, which is what we call the story of the Good Samaritan. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and money, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a Jewish priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed by him. Now, this doesn't tell us where the Jewish priest is going. We do know that he's from the religious society, a prominent member of the church or the temple, we would say. And then he then does not stop or pay this man any attention. Another thing about this man is this, the scripture doesn't tell us that this man is Jewish doesn't tell us if he's a Gentile. It just tells us that it was a man who was beaten up and left half dead beside the road. And the priest came along, saw him, and crossed over to the other side of the road. Verse 32 of Luke 10 says, A temple assistant could be the worship leader, could be the praise and worship leader, could be the music director. It's a person who serves in the temple. That person walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on onto the other side. That means that this person took the time to walk over, knowing that this person needed help. He took a look. But then he left him, walked over to the other side of the road, and went on his way. The scripture doesn't even tell us that they were on their way to worship, that they were on their way to do what priests and worship leaders do. It didn't tell us that. It just says that these are men of high society in the religious world, and they did not give a hoot about this person who was left there half dead. And then verse 33, then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt deep pity. Let me tell you why this is very important. The Samaritan was hated by the Jews. You see, the Jews considered themselves to be pure. And they were when uh, the Babylonians, uh, when they came back from the Babylonian exile and they were in Judah, then they didn't intermingle and intermarry like those in the northern kingdom did when the Assyrians captured them uh, in northern part of in Israel, the northern kingdom. They intermarried in the northern kingdom and the people that were produced by the Jews and the Gentiles were considered what we call half-breeds, or some call them half-breeds. And so those in the southern kingdom were Jews and they believed excuse me, that they were pure bread. And so they wouldn't even eat with them. They didn't have anything to do with those who were not pure. And so both of them were at odds with each other. And so that's why you have the story in John 4 of the woman that Jesus talks to at the well. And people were wondering, how in the world could Jesus do this? This woman is a Samaritan. But the woman is wondering the same thing because she says to Jesus, well, Jews don't have anything to do with us. And so they were at odds with each other. And yet Jesus uses this example of a despised Samaritan who comes along and has pity on the people, on this man who is a victim. So what he does is kneeling down beside him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with medicine and bandaged them. That means that he had something with him. Whatever his supplies were that he carried along, he used what he had so he could be a blessing to this man who was in need. He didn't have to know the man. It just tells us that he was moved with deep pity or compassion. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn 
where he took care of him. He did it himself. He didn't call the paramedics. He didn't call for an ambulance. Of course, they didn't have them back in that day, but he did what he could to be a blessing to someone who was in need. And then verse 35, the next day he handed the innkeeper two pieces of silver and told him to take care of the man. If his bill runs higher than that, he said, I'll pay the difference the next time I am here. It's just, I found that so interesting. He took out of his money, his little money pouch, I would say, and then he took out two pieces of silver. And then what he did was he gave it to the innkeeper. And not if that didn't pay the full bill, then he's saying, hey, I will pay the difference. It doesn't matter that I don't know the man. I don't need to know his name. I just know that he is someone who is in need. And the fact that he's in need is what has prompted me to inconvenience myself because the scripture tells us he's got somewhere to go. He's on a business trip, but he takes the time to help someone who's in need. Now, again, we're looking at being a Christian as opposed to just doing Christian deeds. Okay, and then let's finish this story. All right, so now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked the lawyer. Well, the man replied, the one who showed him mercy he didn't even have the guts to say the Samaritan because he hated the Samaritans were such a hated people. He just said the one or the man or whatever the translation is says that you have. But he did not say the Samaritan because that would make him look bad. And then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now this doing that Jesus refers to, this doing relates to showing love for other people. It doesn't mean just doing good work by going to church and singing in the choir and ushering and deaconing and things like that. It doesn't mean that at all. It means doing what the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord prompts you to do. Let me give you an illustration here about this thing we call Christianity. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So let's say this is the man. This is you. <laughs> and if this is you, then you're nice and pure. Everything's working fine. But there is some sin in you and it needs to be cleansed. Now, what can wash away our sin? We're told nothing but the blood of Jesus. So let's say the blood of Jesus enters. Now what happens? Little crystal light makes a difference here. Now, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? Now, can we separate this? Once, once there's been a change in here, Christ is in us and we're in Christ, okay? The water is in the the uh, crystal light here and the crystal light is in the water. They're inseparable. So once we give our lives to Christ, what we're doing is saying, Lord, I've been crucified along with you. It is no longer I who lives, nevertheless, but Christ who lives in me. In you, I live and move and have my being. That's what we have once we get into Christ and Christ is in us. And so the scripture is really showing us that as we have made this transition from doing our own thing and being our own boss, that we need to live life differently. And what was it that the lawyer said that he would do in order to have eternal life? To gain eternal life, he says, I know that the scripture says that I am to love the Lord my God 
with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, and with all my strength, and then to love my neighbor as myself. Now here's where we run into problems. The problem relates to what the man asked in the second question, who is my neighbor? We have been experiencing and seen a lot of it and will continue to see it, it looks like, until Jesus comes. A lot of racism. It shows that we're looking at people from the outside, but we don't understand that to be Christian means that we're going to love people the way Jesus loved us. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture about that too. I want to share that with you. It's in 2 Corinthians. I, I want to share it. I just want to share what the Lord has to say in his word. In 2 Corinthians 5, beginning at verse 14, <clears throat> I want to point this out. Whatever we do, it is because Christ's love controls us. We're not operating on our own anymore. That there are times when the Lord calls on us to love people who are unlovable. Yes, there are some people, you know some and so do I, who are unlovable. But still, we need to love them anyhow because maybe they've never seen what love looks like. And so it's not like, a, was it Tina Turner who's saying, what's love got to do with it? Love has everything to do with it. So since we believe that Christ died for everyone, we also believe that we have all died to the old life we used to live. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live to please themselves. Instead, they will live to please Christ who died and was raised for them. That's that new life that we're talking about. So we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. Again, we don't know whether the victim in the story of the Good Samaritan was Jewish or a Gentile. But we do know that that person was in need. And if the person was in need, somebody needed to help them. Now, I do know that the religious leaders understood that there was a law that says that they were not to touch a dead body. They were not to go near a dead body. And that would make them ceremonially unclean. And some of the times when they would become unclean, then they needed to be cut off from the Jewish community. I understand that. But there are times when we must inconvenience ourselves or do what we considered to be contrary to the law or under legalism and do whatever it is that our heart prompts us to do. And when we do that, we're being guided by the Spirit of the Lord. And so, as the scripture is saying here, um, and going back to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16, so we have stopped evaluating others by what the world thinks about them. Once I mistakenly thought of Christ that way, as though he were merely a human being. How differently I think about him now, Paul writes. What this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore. For the old life is gone, a new life has begun. See that old me? It's gone. The new me has now been washed in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. And just like this man, these Jews, uh, the Samaritans were uh, rejected and despised, just like they were, then the same thing was happened with the man who was lying there. He was rejected. They didn't want to go to him, the priest or the Levite, and he was despised. I'm not taking the time to do anything with this man. Jesus understood that because he too was rejected and despised and he was nailed to a cross. But I praise God that he didn't just leave him there. That was not the end of the story. This Jesus that we open with saying that Jesus is everywhere, he's still everywhere. And so I'm going to end that song right now with you. Play the rest of that song. This Jesus who was there 
talking to this lawyer is the same Jesus who's in the world today, and he's available to you, my friend. Let's listen to Shirley. Let's listen to the song, please. Jesus, who's everywhere, was very compassionate toward that young lawyer. He knew that this young man was considered an expert in the law. He knew that. And Jesus could have crushed him with his knowledge, but he didn't do that. What he did was he, each time he ended up answering the man's question with a question. So he ended up having this lawyer actually convict himself or condemn himself because one, there was no way that the law could completely be obeyed totally. There was no way that it could be. So that means that the more the man talked about, oh, you got to obey the law and you have to do this and you have to do that. And then he realized that he was guilty. He was guilty. And even when he said, love your neighbor as yourself, does that mean love? Uh, love the Samaritans? Oh my goodness, that's not the case. And so he knew that he was guilty. And again, like we said before, if you break one portion of the law, you are a lawbreaker. It's just that simple. And so I'm so glad that we're not saved by the works that we do. It is not by works, but it's by faith, through our faith in Jesus Christ. For it is that faith in him that makes all the difference in our lives, for we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That grace is unmerited favor. God did it. He gave his son Jesus, and Jesus gave his life that we might have life and have that 
eternal life that he's promised. Yes, we're going to die. It has been appointed unto us every person. We have an appointment with death as we know it in this life. But we shall have eternal life. And it begins the moment that we invite Jesus Christ into our lives. That's when eternal life begins. And then when we go to sleep in this life, then we open up our eyes or we begin a new life eternal in another place. And so every time we see that RIP, R-I-P, we're telling people to rest in peace. Well, I hope they are resting in peace because there is another direction in which people can go to. But the choice has to be made in this life. Do you believe in Jesus? And if so, it's not about just out doing, 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 going. Going to church doesn't save you. Singing in the choir doesn't save you. Being a preacher doesn't save you. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So how do we really know that we're saved? Again, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There ought to be something different about you. And I say be, not do. There's some people who are saved and they never go to church. There's some people who love the Lord with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their mind and all their strength. And they are busy doing some other things that show that they love their neighbors. So how do we love God? We do so by showing that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And the works that Jesus did in justifying himself, not that he had to, but he actually had this lawyer get to know who he was by simply having this dialogue with him and then had the man condemn himself. He evaluated himself, really. Well, this same Jesus is available to you. He's available to each one of us, and he cares about you. As the song says, he's everywhere. And whatever he's done in the past, I want you to know he'll do it again because he's that kind of God. And so don't fret. Don't worry about, oh, I broke this law and the Lord can't possibly love me because I murdered, I lied, I cheated, I, I committed adultery. He loves you, my friend. And he's willing to receive you unto himself. And he's willing to forgive. Just simply ask. And when you ask, don't be like that lawyer. One who is caught up in the fact that he maybe graduated from some sophisticated seminary or, or institution. Remember, Jesus called some fishermen to come and be with him. They didn't go to school. They went to be with Jesus. And he taught them everything that they needed to know in order to turn the world upside down. I thank you so much for listening. May the good news bless your heart. Remember, Jesus loves you, and I'm praying for you. And this Jesus who did great things in the past in your life, he'll do it again. Shirley Caesar sings that now. Have a blessed day. You may feel down and feel like God has somehow forgotten that you are faced with circumstances that you can't get through right now it seems that there's no way out you're going under God's proven time and time again he'll take care of you the sun.